the book of revelations it talks if anybody takes ads or takes anything away from this what? the last thing it says in the back where's my bible I am so excited to do my third conversation with Miss Andrea, the lovely lady here. So I'm so happy to be here with my good friend, Kate. Um, I love collaborating with her and I love her honesty and enthusiasm. So, Thanks. so glad to be doing this again. So I am on a journey to learn, to grow. I, have, I know I have so much to learn. And I want to do these kind of conversations for people like me who want to learn as well, who want to add their voice, tell their story, um, just get better. And one thing that I am just so done with is how is my what the whitewashed education I got in school. I grew up in America, and how systematic racism is still and. I want, I feel like learning from the past can really help to make the future better. So one of the things that I'm very curious about is the intersection of, I say faith in quotations because of what the whole thing is actually about, the intersection of faith and racism and how Christians use the Bible <laughs> to perpetuate to like slavery and racism and systems in place that are still hurting people today. Okay, how the Bible was used as propaganda to reinforce segregation. <laughs> it's sorted. I don't know where they ever got the notion that it was okay to take people and make them do your work for you. Um, except that it's mentioned many times in the Bible um, with the Israelites being that whole thing, Moses, yeah. you know, the, the Israelites being enslaved in, in Egypt. Historically, it was more of a spoils of war, you know? So if you conquered a people, then you could kill the men and take the women and children and all their goods. Um, but you know, when we know better, we do better. And over time, people got better at saying, this is mine, don't come over here, not fighting you, we're not doing that. You know, through time, through time, slavery became less like, I conquered you, I take your things, I take your people, they're mine now. Um, but somewhere at some point, when we got to America, they were doing the whole indentured servant thing, where if a poor person wanted to come over, they could work for whoever paid their way for seven years and then they were free. That wasn't exactly profitable for the people who were paying the way. And they needed to find ways for, to keep those people slaves longer. They were, they were picking up slaves in Africa. Um, North Africans were capturing and selling West Africans or East Africans, South Africans. And, um, and I'm paraphrasing a lot here. This is just my own personal knowledge of how this went. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point they just started taking everybody. Um, but they needed those perma slaves <laughs> because the temporary slaves was not profitable. Um, in my personal family history, there are stories and rumors that I'm starting to doubt because my family started to do DNA and different things are being shown. Um, <laughs> that, and, and this is actually true historically that the slave owners started breeding Africans with Irish because now that those children were part with their Irish slaves, now that those children were part African, they could keep them. A brown person, paper bag, shade or lighter were needed for in the house because <sighs> they didn't want dark skinned people in the house. I just don't get this world. And so I've always been told that I was part Irish, but my DNA is showing North African. 
which is crazy mm. because the North Africans were started capturing the other Africans and so on. Wow. So. But I mean, I've, I've heard <laughs> you got to take those DNA tests to the grain of salt. Like every cousin has taken it except me. Uh huh. And it's just coming up North African. Huh. Not quite Egyptian, but very North African. And if you look at my daughter's profile, it's 100% Egyptian. So <laughs> you can't get into the heads of what made them say, well, if we get people that don't look like us as slaves, then we can justify keeping them. And then somehow legally they did. Because you couldn't do that to white slaves. You couldn't keep them past the seven years because they could just leave. And how is anybody going to find them? Right. They can just blend in. But, you know, this doesn't blend so hot. Um, and so that made it easier. Mm. And so, and then they look back at the Bible and they're like, see, they had slaves in Bible and, the, in, you know, and parts of the Bible say, you know, um, obey your master. So that's biblical and so cool. You know, and the Bible also says, after so many years, let them go free. Indentured servitude. <sighs> but they were able to use race to differentiate between who could be let free and who could be owned as cattle. <sighs> so if my people started off um, selling people what came around, went around. Yeah. K karma. Mm-hmm. Um, where the, the, the men are savages, the women are over sexualized, and they're just not that bright. So bless their hearts. What we're gonna do is bring them into our homes and have them work for us so that we give them purpose in life. And now we don't have to do nothing because we're lazy. And that's just me adding on because it all just reeks of laziness to me. Moved to New Orleans in 1999. I lived there through mid 2000. Uh, summer. Uh, didn't go to church the whole, no, went to church three times. The whole time I was there. Because if you walked into a white church they would, they would stop at the door and say, oh, our sister church is down the street. Their sister church was the black church of the same denomination. Yes, ma'am. And if you walked into a black church, you didn't see a white face anywhere. And that's not how I was raised and that's not how I was going to hang out. Because there's nothing Christian about that. So I did end up going to a big mega church a few times and there were some white people there, but this mega church also has um, a location here in Atlanta. So it wasn't necessarily a New Orleans mindset, but no, I didn't go to church the whole time I was there. I'm I wasn't just, doing it. I am just in shock. The late nineties, you're not welcome here. They were real sweet about it. They're like, oh, you must be in the wrong place. Our sister church is down the street. That's even. I, went, I packed up my kids, got in the car, went back home. The, the sweetness makes it worse in my heart. Now, the Catholic churches weren't like that. Um, but I wasn't Catholic. Mm. I was raised Catholic, but I wasn't Catholic. And I wasn't really interested in going to that huge, 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 huge uh, Catholic Church in downtown New Orleans. It was just hmm. too big, overwhelming to me. I think that there are a lot of people that are leaving church to find God. That wasn't my goal, but I think that was my outcome. And I, I still deal with a couple of churches. Um, I do volunteer work with a couple of churches, but I'm not a parishioner. And I won't be because I've never been in a church where someone didn't say something complimentary, that was complimentary, that was always also sideways. Like, for example... <laughs> Four Sorry. years ago, in a room full of summer campers, theater summer camp, 
because I'm very involved in community theater. Uh-huh. And I, my community theater was asked to come and host a summer camp at this church for the children. And it was cool. I was in charge of costuming and props. And there was um, a parent helper in the room because I would get the kids for an hour and I'd say, okay, we're going to paint this. We'll see how it comes out, you know, or, you know, we're going to, we, we have this rack of costumes, who's going to wear what, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. And this parent actually happened two years in a row. Two years in a row. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> the first year, it was a woman who was just very much bigger than me, and I'm not small. I'm not small by any means. Um, but she was just standing over me, asking and asked me in front of all these children if I voted for Obama because I was black. And that wasn't the first time that happened. That happened in another church somewhere else, also. And I asked her if she voted for um, McCain because she was white. But I had to say it under my breath because I wasn't going to do to the children what she had just done. Right. Do you think she heard you under your breath? Huh? Do you think she heard you under your breath? She absolutely heard me. I was staring right into her eyeballs. Oh, man. Juicy drama. And I just gave it back to her. Mm. But I could see the children staring. Can feel their little eyes, you know. <laughs> so a year later, same classroom, different parent helper. Um, and what she said was, "Tell me about your family." And I was like, "Oh yeah, my kids are in college because they were at the time. You know, my husband is an executive; he's Jamaican." Oh, good, she says, because I hear that Black American men are ghetto. Twitch, twitch, twitch. And I told her off right in front of the children. What did you say to her? I have five brothers. They are Black American men. They are not ghetto. I have a son. He's a Black American man. He is not ghetto. Don't ever say that again. Oh, no, no, I'm not racist. I adopted a daughter from Guatemala. I'm like, you need to stop saying that too. Wow. And, and she came to my theater one time when I was, I would think I was directing something and she came and she wanted a hug and I was like, eh. <clears throat> <laughs> I just come, my whole body just gave her a giant no. And this one was way smaller than me. It's crazy. But um, I was like, that was the last time I volunteered for that kind of a deal. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm involved with that church's um, theater program because I'm really good friends of the guy who runs it. And actually another woman who's involved in the church heavily is my business partner, Mm -hmm. which is why I have the relationship there. But they both know that I love their pastors. I love the way their churches run. I like the denomination but their congregation needs some help Mm. because they do have black people in the congregation, but they don't have any black Americans in the congregation. It's a symptom of that helping syndrome. Let's invite the Africans in because we can help them. Mm. So interestingly enough this year, they just got an African-American associate pastor. Oh, nice. But it's just also the savior mentality of all these poor people from these backwards countries and their grass floors and their mud huts. And it's like, um, excuse me, their country is better than yours. They have better health care, better resources. Better. <laughs> and I understand my husband was born in a house with a dirt floor. There you go. However... <laughs> You know, I was born in a house with a marble floor. Uh, the, the part of the city I lived in had marble floors um, because it had at once been a rich white suburb. Mm. Um, but, you know, white flight left it to the poor people. There you go. It, 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 it just, and to this day, I've been in churches where racial reconciliation tried to happen. Oh, 
the white congregation gets mad and leaves because they say, well, why can't we just love each other? That's what we're trying to do, you morons. I don't understand what your microaggressions are doing and it's not love. Mm. So many people have come up to me and said, I have a bag of clothes for your children. And I'm like, oh, I have a bag of clothes too. You want to trade? <gasps> No. You understand? Yeah. I want to hear what it's, I want to talk to somebody who's experienced race relation training happening in a church and it going well, and people are actually willing to listen and grow and get better. I wonder if that's happened. It must have happened. There must be people who are in tune with God and listening to the Holy Spirit and fe feeling some kind of nudge to say, wow, I've been wrong. I'm sorry. Like, if this isn't ever happening, then where the, what is God doing? Is God like this? I, I, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and just cast it all off, but I, I'm seeing hints of it, but the pastors have to be super down low. They can't say we've done a disservice to our black family. What like, kind of like Jesus says, love one another. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I see it. I see it. And I, and I feel like eventually they're going to be like, okay, let's talk about the horse I've been beating for several years and let's just get this on the table. Um, and I, you know, I've met white pastors who don't have their own church, who this is their mission and they go from church to church. God bless them. Um, then seldom invited back a second time because they don't they don't bite their lips man they say what's on their heart so the right people exist um you just have to ask yourself am i willing to lose a third of my church easy mm. for that's for, the for problem long -term, long -term. <laughs> when it when church became a business where you had to get that tithe to pay the bills and you had to only get people who would say what the the people who hired the pastor wanted to hear that was just the beginning of that was just a downfall right there yeah 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 because because church is a business and so if you say what's right and a third of the people disagree with you your church is going to be unhealthy for 10 years you have to ask yourself isn't it worth it but I feel like I know God is still real and I know God is still moving because I feel this passion to keep having conversations like this in hope that, that people will hear it and those seeds will be planted in their hearts to say like, wow, I want to be a part of the change. I, I am a hundred percent Christian um, and a hundred percent unchurched. <laughs> I hear you. It's not safe. It's mm -hmm. not safe for me. It hasn't been safe for my kids. But they're like, we dealt with some serious crap growing up in the name of Christianity and we don't want any part of it. Mm. Do they still believe in God? Mm -hmm. Very strongly. Very strongly. I always thought my son would end up as a pastor. His, his moral compass is straight. Mm. Well, I think what the world needs is more internet pastors, more YouTubers, more, mm -hmm. more bloggers, more Maybe. Zoom, Maybe. Zoom community churches while we're in this pandemic times so that people can not feel completely alone in their faith. Like, Maybe. So this is something that I wrote that I think kind of applies to the whole, the, the whole machine of, of religion. A desire to reach the lost without a desire to nurture the saved is incomplete. Babies can't feed themselves, care for themselves. When the family members are reeking of unchanged diapers and sobbing from helpless hunger, who wants to be adopted into that? The house of God is big enough for everyone. Sunday, servant is, Sunday service isn't a club, yes, but we're meant to grow beyond what holds us back. Learn, teach, encourage, heal, bind up. We need to be equipped, have our spiritual battles under his control before we take on more. Pushing people into battles they aren't ready for, that God hasn't called them to, could destroy them. Who's left the family home? Those who never felt they belonged. Babies forced to serve, taught to repeat empty words. 
hunger and longing for the father they were promised but never felt, the seed of faith shriveled in the burning sun, dry hearts long for the living water, dry wells don't beckon anyone, they crawl in the, in the desert, help me, anyone. That is on point. Um, at your age, my husband and I were church leaders. 30, 31, 32, um, unequipped, ill-equipped. Um, church leaders, because we gave a good tithe. I said those were our prosperous years. <laughs> um, always asked for training. All we ever really got was a good DISC profile. What profile? DISC you know, what is your, your leadership style? Oh, yeah. Your, your, your work personality? Because you're only as good as what they can suck out of you in so many places. And then when we hit not prosperous times, we weren't asked to leave, but we felt a lot of cold shoulders. And that was kind of when we were like, exit, exit. This is not for us. So back to slavery. <laughs> Do you know that they used the religion to control the slaves? I think I may have heard about that, but I don't know details. Um, once again, this is just what I've learned through being alive. Um, <laughs> they... They didn't allow them to read, so they didn't allow them to read the Bible, but they would pick a very docile slave and teach him the Negro Bible, which had everything in it about rebelling stripped from it. So, and they would give them Sundays off or Sunday mornings off, not the house slaves, but the field slaves. Um, to have church and to learn how to be subservient to your master as it is taught in the Bible. Wow. Are there copies of this Negro Bible? Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. I would love to see that, like, see just how much they took out. It's not Amazon. The Negro Bible, dash the slave Bible. <gasps> Section, select parts of the Holy Bible selected for use of the Negro slaves in British West India Islands. It's like to only talk about docile parts. Like there's a, there's a curtain in the book of Revelations. It talks if anybody takes ads or takes anything away from this. That's the last thing it says in the back. Where's my Bible? <laughs> I got like three of them on a shelf behind me somewhere. The I read, I read the Revelations more than any other book because, you know, I was taught dispensationalism. And so I was like, rap, want to be rapture ready, not be left behind, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I do not believe in the rapture anymore. And I, I think a lot of the things, it's not just I think, a lot of the things in the Bible were written for that very specific audience, especially you Revelations. Know, a, a lot of the Bible... um is is used to keep people loyal and in check yep propaganda but, baby but, huh propaganda let me read this to you okay the anglican church along with slave owners in the british west indies and united states conspired to alter the holy bible for the purpose of converting slaves to the christian faith while taking from them all hope of personal freedom found in the Bible. The fact that the Christian faith, a religion one third of the world relied on to bring comfort, spiritual rest, peace and salvation was the narrative being controlled makes the slave Bible the ultimate propaganda tool and the greatest lie ever told. Ugh, that makes me so angry. Someone in 1933 wrote The Miseducation of the Negro. So we should also look into that. Yeah, a man's thinking you don't have to worry about his actions, which is why we weren't allowed to read 
because we could get our hands on the real Bible weren't meant for us. How the Christian, here's those big old quotation marks again, American dream and wealth and health of the 1950s was possible because it was only for white people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just in education generally, um, for someone to be the best, someone has to be the worst. For someone to do very well, someone has to do very poor. Otherwise, everyone's just doing. Right? Yeah. And so to have that prosperity, that rampant prosperity for many, it had to be on the backs of somebody. Mm. It might as well be on the backs of the people who we've dehumanized so that we feel good about ourselves because they're not fully thinking humans anyway. I mean, th th that's the idea behind it. Th there are many scientists have done studies that said black people are slower. Oh, honey, yeah. No, this is how they justified it. And that's why education is so important to me. Yeah, totally. Especially education of young Black men, because they're often pushed to go into the workforce. They're often told, you're not college ready. And, and I, I want, I'm not saying trades are bad. Trades are great. But I feel like everyone should have a taste of higher education and then mm. decide mm. which means we need to undumb down our high schools because mm -hmm. high school used to be far more stringent and and they took that away and moved a lot of that learning to the first two years of college wow that's interesting because, uh, because college used to be where you went to specialize and now you have to spend two years doing you know that standard crap huh that you should have learned in high school, which is why a lot of the really smarter kids do the AP stuff because then they can test out of that. Right. I was not a motivated to college person because I'll- I was thinking my parents didn't give me a choice. They were like, ha ha, guess what you're doing? Yeah. Well, my parents <laughs> didn't go to college either. They got married mm -hmm. right out of high school and had mm -hmm. me right away almost. Mm -hmm. My dad didn't go past sixth grade, but but he valued education so much. I was I was too intimidated by the thought of debt, and I'm glad I didn't go to college. I'm glad I don't have this hundred thousand dollar useless degree mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. debt hanging over me my entire life. Like, well, here's the thing: it shouldn't be a cost. <laughs> Which is why I'm just so passionate about teaching people how to learn mm. on their own. Because there are ways to get degrees in the U.S. without ever setting foot in a school. Cool. That can cost you maybe 10000 at the end of the, you know what I'm saying? Nice. Maybe five, maybe seven. You can test your way through college. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, with the Bible hidden from 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 slaves, like... When did it start getting better? When did when did people start being allowed to read and actually know what the Bible actually had to say? Like, how did the faith of the black person get to a, a healthier place? There were a few slaves who were taught to read. Um, oh gosh, who's the guy that was friends with Lincoln? Dang, Frederick Douglass. Oh yeah, his master's wife. Um, taught him to read behind her husband's back. Yeah. And, and, and there were several instances of this. So when slavery ended, these were the leaders and they went out and they spoke to the Mormons and they financed um, normal colleges, which were schools for teachers to learn how to teach. The second slavery ended, hundreds of colleges were open. Um, across the south and middle of the country and even some in the north because um, black people still weren't allowed in white schools. So what they did was they opened hundreds of colleges for teachers and that generation got the education, okay. you know, and rolled it out. 
So that would have that, been and, in the 1890s, right? And so even through restoration, where they kind of took back the South and, and resubjugated Black people, they weren't smart enough to know to shut our schools back down. We weren't bothering them going to school. Well, that was God there. That was God, because that is the only thing that survived emancipation mm. when, when, when they did reconstruction. I need to learn more about this reconstruction thing. And this is where HBCUs come from. If it's called an HBCU, it is a historically black college and university. Historically, not only. Mm. And a lot of people get that confused. Why do we need HBCUs? There are historically black colleges and universities because historically black people weren't allowed in colleges and universities. That's why they exist. And, and there have been white valedictorians of HBCUs, all are welcome, but don't, understand, don't misunderstand why it's there. Mm. And don't understand why this current generation is flocking back to them because they can't fall asleep on the couch in the common room at Yale without the college police showing up. Don't get me started. <laughs> You know? Good stuff. I mean, bad stuff, but good stuff to talk about. The truth is always good. Yeah. It yeah. might be painful. It might be annoying. It might hinge my neck out a little bit. Um, but, <laughs> but the truth is always good. Because yeah. the truth will set us free. And, and that's why we've been on a four-year campaign to muddy the truth in this country. Because when you can call the truth fake news and plant the craziest alternate facts into the heads of the populace, and you can build a little pseudo race war. Oh yeah, because scientists- Black people have never wanted a race war. We over here chilling, trying to live. Because you can't trust any scientist because they're all lizard people with that are in a cabal of, child hurting blood drinking whatever like they're just nuts they're just they need serious There's psychological help. a wave of anti-intellectualism going on yeah i'm like oh so real stupid people got it because i look we all have our prejudices we all have our biases i can't tolerate people who won't learn mm -hmm. i can't do it. And I'll tell you why. I was raised in a household with someone who at the time was called mentally retarded. That was the phrase in the 70s and 80s. My oldest stepsister was developmentally delayed. Mm -hmm. Actually, she'd had a head injury as a baby. Mm. Um, and if she could teach me to read when the schools could not, I have no patience for anyone who won't learn. Mm. I don't care what you learn. I don't care what your gift is. I don't care if it's art. I don't care if it's, I don't care. But when you hear a new fact, you're supposed to rub it together with what you know and maybe look something up. Yeah. I really am loving this book so much. I highly recommend it. Unraptured by Zach Hunt. Of course, we all have preconceived ideas about what Jesus taught, preached, and stood for that come into play. In our telling of the gospel, Jesus often believes all the things we believe and despises all the people we despise, which is why we need help keeping our preconceived ideas and biases in check so that as we go about reading the Bible and trying to understand what is being said, we always remain, remain focused on love, just as Jesus was. But I, what I was trying to think of was how people use, use the Bible to fit their biases. Everyone everyone uses their Bible, uses the Bible to fit their biases. 